Hello there and welcome to the Whole Healed Holy Podcast, a place for conversations of the heart, for exploring healing, divinity, and all things sacred. I'm your host, Patricia Russo. I'm a mystic, muse, and spiritual teacher guiding women into their hearts with a journey of softening. I'm a published poet, a lover of hearts, and a forever student. Welcome, love, to a sacred pause and hopefully a few tingles, and to a reminder that we are all whole, healed, and holy. I'm so happy you're here. Let's slip into today's episode. My heart is so happy to be here with my guest today because my heart loves this sister and has since the first time I met her. You know the kind of instant connection of remembering when you encounter or meet someone for the first time and you have a sense that you've known them before or a remembering of something familiar. This is how I feel about my guest today. I always start with this like really brainy biography that our listeners can find easily on their own and then I move to my gift of sharing how I see you. Amelia has always been dedicated to soul work and has always been in deep devotion to the sacred. She is a keeper of ancient mysteries, dedicated to the healing arts, poet, herbalist, birth keeper, doula, energetic body worker, therapist, and embodiment teacher. She's been studying with different ancestral wisdom keepers, mystics, and healers from around the world. Her work bridges the seen and the unseen. She works with groups one-on-one and facilitates space of deep remembrance through ritual and ceremony. She works a lot in connection with water as the primordial element through her work with birth and conception and as an aquatic body worker. Her work is very intuitive, subtle, and grounded in her profound love for this world and all being. I see you, Amelia, as sacred. Really, like when I think of that word, I think of you. And as I witness you in the world, I witness you through the lens of sacred. There's a quality of sacred energy about you in everything that you do. It is delicate and careful, intentional, pure, and full of sanctity. You have a gentle spirit and you are a bright light. The way that you've held space for me and share your wisdom with me and circles that I've welcomed you into is with a tremendous poise and grace and love. Your essence is feminine, soft and welcoming, and your heart is wide open. You are generous and kind, and this is the way that you walk with all that you create and share. You are a lover, a lover of life, of words, of sisters, of wisdom, of beauty, of all creatures and all things. And for me, this feels very feminine, like you are the feminine embodied. That's how I see you. And I'm so happy that you're here, just like so that I could selfishly like be in your energy. I wonder if you hear that a lot. Like if you know a sister, if you're listening and you know a sister like this, it's like, like you don't even have to say anything. I get the beautiful gift today of seeing Amelia as we do this interview together, but I know that you'll, as you listen, that you'll be able to feel her. I love the quality of that too. And that's one of the reasons why I love podcasts is because you don't have this vision in front of you to distract you. You can like really take in the energy and the words and the sense and and the wisdom of what's being shared. But I have this beautiful gift today of seeing you and just being here with you like in a more alive way. And it feels so, so good. And that's one of my favorite things about you on a long list things that I love. Thank you for being here. I just want to pause for a moment and just have you like receive that before we launch into our questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for having me. (laughs) What does it feel like to be a wisdom keeper? I love that part of your bio and that part of what you do like, and I would love to deepen in with whose wisdom are you the keeper and sharer of Can you tell us more about your journey with ancient wisdom and especially maybe your lineage of teachers, like this wisdom that you're the keeper and sharer of? I would just love to start here so that we have like a little foundation to ground us before we maybe move and flow into other directions. What a beautiful question. Hmm. 
What am I the wisdom keeper of? Well, as soon as you shared this question, my first instinct was, I guess I'm becoming the keeper of wisdom, yeah? There is a sense that for me, wisdom keepers are people who have walked on this earth long enough and have wrinkles and uh, can be considered elders in this world. So I would like to begin with the humbleness of saying that I'm on that path of keeping wisdom and honoring all of those that, not the many, but those that are still on this earth and have walked this life with the sacred close to them and can be said to be fully wisdom keepers. Having said so, I have learned from, um, yeah, many different traditions. I think my journey really began because I felt so out of any tradition. I felt very alone. Yeah. In all of the questions I had, in all of the inquiries that I had and I had no elder, I had no teacher, I had no community, I had no barely family that could hold me in those questions. And so at a very young age, I began to seek people that could give me answers. And this has definitely brought me to experience wisdom from all directions. My journey began with more of the Eastern traditions. I began with meditation and in particular Theravada Buddhism and was studying a lot that and really immersed myself in the silence that this tradition brought me to in, in arriving back in my body, which sort of was the second step of the lineages that I followed, really seeking yeah, mentors around how to live in this body more deeply. And so immersed myself very much in all of the technologies of yoga and tantra, ancient tantra, and explored those technologies that could allow me to access the architecture of my body more. <laughs> I really see it as a path. And that sort of led me then to question more okay, what is my relationship, not only with this physical, my own physical body, but with the body of the earth. And so I began to study with different wisdom keepers from what we might call indigenous groups, although I am wary of using that word. And so I sat with people from all around the world and began this inquiry of what it means to be in right relationship with the earth and how to be wise. <laughs> in a very simple way. And that has has and continues to be a lot of where I gather wisdom from. But lately, I've really come back to sort of the origins of myself in this world right now, which is really my Italian roots and traditions, and really connecting more and more with the mysticism of my own people. <laughs> and so with what we might call Christian mysticism or, yeah, more indigenous Mediterranean ways of knowing. And this feels a lot like a homecoming where I'm realizing I don't have to go very far away <laughs> to find wisdom. I love that. I love that, right? It's so simple, but also so profound at the same time that you're wanting to be deeper in the body. At, on the surface, it it sounds so simple, but it's not, it's like we can't even be as deeply in our bodies as we want to be in a lifetime. It's like, there's so much there. And this full circle of coming back home feels so beautiful. I love that. What's the difference between learning and remembering or wisdom and knowing? Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. Just get your perspective on that. Yeah, knowing to me feels like an act that happens only in the so-called brain, in the logical mind. Uh, we can know many things. We're very good at knowing many things. I think in our society right now, we can have access to a lot of knowing. We can read a lot of books. We can be very eloquent in a lot of also deep conversations. But to have wisdom, yeah, to know at this deeper level is something that has to definitely go through experience. 
there is a quality that drops the desire to be right or wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not about that. It's something that oftentimes ends up in silence. And it's something that really happens in the body. And by body, I'd love to expand on our, you know, very mechanic understanding of what the body is. By body, I mean this self, yeah, this body, this being that we are. So wisdom is something that is carried in our cells, in our bones, in our spirits, in our souls. It resonates on all of these levels of being, on all of the bodies that we are. And it doesn't show off. It's not trying to say my knowing is better than your knowing. It's a remembrance, as you used this word before. It's a unraveling of what is already there. And it's um, quiet in some ways. It's just vibrates and we just know. It's ancient and fully future oriented and present and it doesn't need the logical mind to necessarily explain itself it might use it but it doesn't need it i really feel like this is our realm this is the realm that you and i like to spend time in not the the knowing or the learning or the wisdom even although i love that this quality that you're adding to the word wisdom which is really more in the vein of something that is or something that's passed down or something that's lived. I really love that. But you and I like to spend most of our time in the realm of the remembering or of the knowing that is, and as you say it, that is in your body, that is at the cellular level. And I'm jumping a little bit ahead in my notes here, but is this what you would call soul work? The soul work that you do is how do you bring in the essence of remembering knowing and wisdom with soul work and is it about, yeah. about remembering what you already know <laughs> yeah yeah it's a beautiful question and you know i'm refining this concept if we want to call it concept but this idea constantly because really this way of the soul uh, this idea of soul work was born much prior to when i could have even a rational understanding i did not have words i just remember myself as a 12 years old teenager going to my best friends and telling them, we'll create the school of the soul. Yeah. And I'm not sure I really knew what I was talking about, but I'm pretty sure I had understood like what comes to me now is the taste of what I was talking about. I had no words and it took me many, many years and I'm still in the process of refining and understanding also with that more knowing way, like what am I talking about? What is soul? What is soul work? Yeah. This to say, you know, it's in ourselves, as you so beautifully said. And it was in my 12 years old self that knew something without having read any book, without having had a parent or family member that ever really used that word. And so now the way I really understand soul work is, is really this bridging of the seen and the unseen. Yeah. It's this, um, the soul is really this part of us that is eternal and at the same time is so embedded in the nowness. And so it's working with these two dimensions. Yeah. It's remembering the essence of who we are beneath all those layers of story that we have been conditioned to believe in, that we have decided to believe in, and go to what is deeper, more fundamental, with what is in some ways more wild, I love to say, because it doesn't conform to the parameters of the world although it might sometimes but it doesn't have to so there is a quality that is more free more wild and soul is sort of the bridge between spirit and matter in my understanding and um it's sort of what allows us to also have remembrance of other planes of being and translate it in our day-to-day -day life and how to live with that awareness. Mm -hmm. That is really beautiful. I'm just sitting with that for a moment. 
and feeling into that. And I think that's where this piece of living with the sacred or being sacred sort of finds itself. Why, in your mind, who is doing soul work and why should we do soul work? (laughs) And I'm saying should with a very small S because (laughs) I wouldn't dare tell anyone that they should do this or should do that. But for the yous and the me's who are deeply on a path of like really wanting to be in our soul, sit with our soul, be guided by our souls, be in soul work as we like to be with the, the service that we do. Who is doing this work in your experience and why is this work so important? Yeah, I guess who is doing it is all of the curious souls that, you know, start asking why. <laughs> who am I? Why? Why this? Why that? Yeah, it always starts with an inquiry and oftentimes it ends with another inquiry. But it's anyone who wants to have a deeper understanding of what it means to live on this earth. Anyone who might begin feeling unsatisfied of their lives, unsatisfied of how the world is functioning and begins to ask the entry point can be very different yeah it can be yeah asking why it can be suffering it can be the loss of someone it can be a sudden remembrance of like oh okay there's more (laughs) Uh, it can be falling in love yeah it can be so many things that bring us to this work and maybe even being born into a family that doesn't understand you or that doesn't have the answers for you. Like I absolutely well than asking questions that everyone around you couldn't answer. That's that resonates with me as I remember. And maybe this is, we can touch on this a little bit around what does it mean to be a mystic? Because I feel like for me, it's like, that's it. It's like you come into this body with like all this remembering and all this knowing and all the resource of a true trust in something bigger, something more divine. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. So maybe it can be that just the curiosity of, wait, you have, there's something bigger. What is that thing that's bigger? Yeah. Oftentimes, you know, people say, oh, I'm not spiritual or that is not who I am. And I always remind them that they can't really claim that because we all are. We might not want to explore that part of us but it's there soul is there it's not that i have soul you don't have soul it's like we all came on this earth because of soul we are soul yeah and yeah with that that feels like so right and so good to like yeah like it is yeah yeah and it's just about turning our gaze turning our attention towards that yeah towards the words in between words towards the movement in between what we see. And before you asked, why is this work important? I feel this work is important for so many reasons. It's important if you care about living in your full aliveness. It's important if you care about having deep intimacy with others. It's important for our world right now. So much of soul has been deprived so much of this aliveness. And so it's so important to bring healing and to live in our fullest potentiality, this human experience. Part of the questions I came in this world with was really why? Why am I in this world? What is it about? I don't understand. And many years later, there's an understanding that it was easier for me to want to return back to the other world. And so I was sort of almost fighting my being here. And I was questioning, what is this about, especially in a world where I did not see all of the values that I felt were important, which was love and reciprocity and kindness and aliveness also. Yeah. 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 Part of me wants to deepen in with that piece, if I may, just Mm -hmm. Um, this wasn't planned, but I feel like there's something here. When we do have these curiosities and when we do have this real feeling of this connection to this part of us that we feel like is just so true, the soul of us, spirit, 
oftentimes, and as you described, which I also believe, it's like we're living in this soul as a soul and in this body at the very same time, <laughs> as if it couldn't get any more complicated. And I think that's like where a lot of your our work kind of comes in. It's like navigating this place that we're in at the very same time, the soul and the human experience. And you touched on this a little bit around the limitations of that, the pain and suffering of that. And I would love to just have you just deepen in there a little bit if there's anything mm-hmm. more around yeah. what you felt in those moments or like how you found your way out or and if this is part of your work and yeah. um, this feels like yeah. part of your personal um, healing yeah. journey. Yeah. yeah, for a very long time, I felt like I did not inhabit this body. I somehow did not want to inhabit this body. And as I said, I sat with many questions of what is life about? And I always felt a lot, uh, was very alive in my inner waters of feeling. And it took many years of sitting with these questions and also the consequences of these questions, which were not easy because for quite a few years, I felt like I lived sort of two realities. The reality of having to like operate in a world that felt so broken to me. And that was part of my suffering as well, that it wasn't only that I had to live in a body because then later on I began to fall in love with the body, but it was that I had to live in a reality that to me felt so not ensouled. Yeah. So broken. And it took me many years of feeling this strong disconnection, this strong alienation, this strong sense of like, I just want to go back home. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not sure what am I doing here? Yeah. And of course, having this utter love that was just hidden behind all of this suffering, this love for being here and this profound desire to experience this life so fully, but that for some reason I did not know how to. On top of that, in my own personal journey, I was using the body a lot growing up as I was a gymnast. And so I was using the body in this very sort of uh, controlling way. Yeah. It felt like the body was so squeezed, (laughs) squeezed in the tense muscles of a gymnast's body until everything broke apart, as it always does. And I began to hear this voice that said, return back. Yeah, I'm not your enemy. I am here to welcome you. I am your temple. Yeah, I am the place where you can experience all that you yearn so deeply to experience, this intimacy, this belonging, this love, it can be experienced through me. And so my journey of reconnecting to the body began where I began to, first of all, unravel layers of hurt and suffering that was stored in my body through one of my greatest mentors and teachers with whom I studied many, many years and still do called Angela Farmer. and. Uh, She works a lot with this idea of the feminine unfolding, this idea of unraveling, of softening, of becoming more porous. And slowly, 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 it felt like being this soul that was just like uh, floating on top of me was like, oh, it's safe. I can be born. Mm. I can enter. Yeah. I can enter. And for me, it's become very relevant work, this work of embodying ourselves, because I feel that in some ways we are all trapped outside of our bodies, whether it's through these type of inquiries or whether it's through living so much in the mind, by which I mean brain. And so we don't actually fully embody and inhabit this first home that our souls chose to inhabit. And this piece came in as well much later of choice. Yeah, of I chose to live this human experience. I am here. I'm here to live this body 
to feel joy through this body, to feel pleasure through this body, to feel aliveness through this body. And so slowly I began to bridge the body and soul. It wasn't anymore my soul feeling trapped or disconnected. Everything was woven, stitched back together. And a lot of reverence came to the body. That feels like a spiritual awakening to me. Yeah, that feels like a spiritual awakening to me. Like this is, for those of you listening, like this is like the mic just dropped. Like this is the secret. <laughs> this is the secret to life. Like when you have this big remembrance that we're, the body is the whole point, as Megan Watterson says, like this is the vehicle by which we've come into to feel and to experience. And yeah. um, the way that you just described it as this soul of you is hovering above, just kind of feeling displaced and focused on that feeling of not being home, which resonates so deeply with me because I have those moments where I too just want to say, like, wave the white flag and say, okay, I give up. <laughs> where, when's the next spaceship home? You know, like, when can I zoom myself out of here? I've had those moments. And when you have this, like, wow, it is, feel, I feel like very much a, part of the spiritual journey to like have this message just like really hit you that oh wait it's about being in the body it's about it's about integrating these parts and then is it from there that you go into this idea of from the integration and the full embodiment that you begin to carve out what you call a sacred life is it from there from this embodied place that you begin to walk a sacred life and I would love to just kind of switch our focus now and talk about what is it to be living a sacred life? Like, how does that look in a practical sense? You shared that you're doing prayers in the morning and that you have a certain rituals and ceremony as part of it. But yeah, um, yeah, I'm imagining once you arrive in this embodied place where all the parts of you are now on kind of on board with the plan, that's when the sacred life kind of enters. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's when they're not divided anymore. Yeah, the sacred and the profane, the body and the soul. Yeah, I think as humans, we love to separate. And so the body has become this dirty place. Yeah, in so many traditions. And if you are in your body, then you are not living a sacred life. And that's when indigenous ways of knowing came very strongly as sort of a key for me because as I began to sit with elders who to my eyes had so much knowledge and so much wisdom and were so humble and so embodied I started to realize okay they are one the body and the soul and we can experience the sacred through our bodies. We can become the prayer, yeah? And guess what? The whole world is sacred, yeah? The trees, the plants, the rivers, the streams, everything is sacred, everything is ensouled. And so how can we begin to become more porous to listen to these invisible threads, yeah? To begin to receive from the world as well, through our bodies, through this very physical body as well, through our capacity to feel, through our capacity to sense. And in that way, we begin to live a sacred life, a life that is in alignment with the divine plan, which is not something that is up there separate, but is here in every single thing. And so then Prayer becomes a way of being, which doesn't mean we don't need practices to remind ourselves because as humans, we forget very easily. (laughs) And so we need to find our ways that help us stay connected, that help us remember that everything is sacred, that this body is sacred, that this breath is sacred, that the tree out there is sacred, that you are sacred, that I am sacred. And we definitely don't live in a time and era that promotes that way of seeing and being. Yeah. We look at how much we destroy our bodies, how much we destroy the body of the earth. And this causes a lot of suffering and through that suffering, a lot of separation. And so we do need practices that connect us back to the sacred, that connect us back to this remembrance 
and they are unique in some ways to each one of us. And then there's very ancient technologies that, thank goodness, have been carried from different wisdom keepers. And some of the most simple are breath and prayer and presence that are easy and accessible to everyone. Where does sisterhood fit into this for you? I just feel like when I witness you, like it's a total projection because I'm also, just like, I came into this body, into this life really as a big sister. And so just very naturally have very happily and very naturally taken on that role. But is this in your mind, does this feel more feminine to you and more aligned with sister to sister? Like, is, is this a feminine way of walking where does the feminine and the masculine kind of come into this way of being with the sacred or way of being sacred? Because I love that you, I mean, Amelia, the first time you said the word porous in the manifesting love circle, when I invited you that week and you used this word porous, like walking in the world as if you are por- porous, like I love that word and you were, we're poets and we love words. So I am a lover of words. I have not ever forgotten that. And every time I hear that word, I think of you. And it's such a simple reminder to be in a sacred way, to be the sacred that we are, maybe to just be instead of constricting or instead of restricting, yeah. or closing, to be porous, to be open. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I know that was a lot, but really would love to just presence the importance for you as I witness you for doing this work with sisters. How yeah. perhaps the frequency of this idea of the sacred is a little bit more potent for those of us that are in our feminine or those of us that are feeling connected to the feminine energy. Just would love yeah. to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah. Mm. Well, the feminine for me has always felt very familiar in that. And I would like to also begin actually taking a step backwards and saying feminine does not mean necessarily woman but in this specific part of the story it does mean woman it felt always very familiar because I grew up just with a mother and was very much imbued and just embraced by this very strong feminine presence that my mother was We were sisters more than mothers and daughter at various times and everything felt very porous and at times almost without boundaries, which also became something that I had to work through because that is the risk in the feminine that then we forget the I and the I needs to be there to proclaim oneself. I am here. Otherwise, if we are just this hyper porous being, then again, we are losing our sense of being here, which can happen and still happens to me for sure at times where I have to. Of being the soul and the human in the same moment. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So the feminine always felt the easier way to me. Yeah? It felt like the place where I felt at home, where I felt most at ease, despite the fact that I struggled as well with uh, modern concepts of what you called now sisterhood. Yeah, I spent many hours crying with my mother as a child because I would say, why are they so mean? And not to me necessarily, but why are they so mean to each other? Why aren't we like these sisters just saying like, <laughs> hey, I'm I'm here for you no matter what, because that is how I, I knew I wanted to live. And I did not experience that. Of course, the feminine felt more familiar. And at the same time, I did not have, until I was a bit older, true experiences of that. I seeked them. I tried to create them, but it was hard. And for a long time, I definitely stood with this idea that only as women, with women, we could experience this level of the sacred. And then something changed. (laughs) And I began to notice that that was another way of separating as well. The feminine is in each body, each self, no matter the 
shape, the gender, the anything. It's a quality of being, though. It's a quality of being. In our world that is hyper-masculine, we need more feminine. We need more of this way. And so it's just about reawakening this way, which is a way that is more of undoing instead of doing. It's a way of being in reverence. I remember reading this one quote from Osho, and I don't particularly love Osho, but he said, in front of God, be like a woman so that you can receive him. Because if you are like a man, then you always have to go and seek for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So allow yourself to be like a woman that receives the beloved, that receives the lover. And I found that really, really beautiful. And it stayed with me for so many years and still is with me. This idea of, for me, what works best is to receive, to allow myself to become porous, like the feminine, and to say, I am here. I'm receiving life. I'm receiving, I'm receiving, I'm receiving. Everyone can experience this. It doesn't have to be male or female or non-binary or anything like that. Beautiful. I would love to switch gears. And like, this is a, such a fascination that I have about work that you do. And I think it's a personal fascination because I've never witnessed a birth and because I've never been a mother. And so I'm just fascinated with this work that you do as a doula and this work that you do in the birth space. And perhaps you're fascinated as you're, I mean, everyone that I've ever known, I have several dear, dear, dear sisters who are in this work. And just maybe the fascination of this miracle never goes away. But I would really love to learn more about, like, I would imagine that it's a sacred space and a sensual space and a porous space. <laughs> But what is the essence of your work here? And I think this is maybe new, a new deepening in for you since we last chatted. So this is maybe the newest chapter of your work. And for those yeah. of you that don't know Amelia, I wouldn't dare ask you how old you are, but she is like wise beyond her years. <laughs> I've always felt like you have an old soul quality, like you just like when you speak and when you share and when you guide, it just feels like it's coming from like a million lifetimes. Yeah. Mm. Share with us a little bit more about this work that you're doing in the birth space, in the birth realm as a doula. Yeah. Yeah. Recently, and this is very personal, and then I can go more in the impersonal, but I sort of had an insight of why I decided to say yes to this calling of birth. And it has to do with the story that I just said, because for so long, I felt it was hard for me to be in this world. Yeah. And so to begin to witness the arrival of souls in this world was very healing for me. Mm -hmm. To witness this yes, that all of us have declared the moment we stepped into this life was very healing for the part of me that still felt confused. Yeah. For a long time, I was also questioning how much that experience affected our experience of the world itself, how much the way we arrive in this world affects the way we interact and experience the world. And the more I began to dive into studying birth, the more I realized that, of course, nowadays, the way we arrive is and can be very traumatic. It can be very not loving. It can be very not sacred. And with that, I began to study and remember without studying <laughs> other ways, but also hearing stories of people in more traditional spaces where the mother would stay for 40 days after birth just with her baby. And when the baby was born, the man would be outside of the hut singing to the baby as a way to say, we welcome you, we sing you into this world, we greet you, we celebrate you, um, read about ways in which 
a baby after it's been kept for 40 days in this cocoon of transitioning from a spirit world to physical world with the understanding that it takes time for that soul and body to actually come together. And once those days have passed, how the baby would be presented to the sun and to the earth or how our placenta in some traditions is then buried back into the earth as a way to say you are first and foremost daughter, son of the earth. Yeah. And so all of this made me think, wow, I wonder how much this has affected me and how much this has affected all those that did not live any of these experiences, not even the slightest sort of remembrance yeah most of us were born yeah. under neon lights yeah. with very traumatic experiences i was born with a woman pushing on my mother's belly forcefully with women who are not respected in their desire to birth naturally if that's their desire with environments that are not warm, that are not sacred, that are not safe, that are not sensual. That not to say that this cannot happen in hospital settings or that hospitals are bad or anything like that, but the way the sacred is not ever called in really gave me a lot of desire to deepen this and to become what in modern days we call a doula, which is basically someone who, in my understanding, well, doula comes from the Greek word doula, which means to mother the mother. So there's this understanding that you are mothering the mother as she becomes a mother, as she becomes to inhabit this new role. But at the same time, the way I see it is also that a doula is that she or he who sits at the portal and makes sure that the portal is safe and that this soul arrives safely and that this soul arrives lovingly. Yeah. And that this mother can access all of the intelligence that is in her body, in her animal sensual body, like Mary Oliver says in her poem. And that wisdom of her body is reawakened so that she can also empower herself through this birth and say, wow, I am a portal of creation. <laughs> I am literally like bringing. Way. Yeah, it's another way in which you're bridging the seen and the unseen. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, witnessing being part of birth is literally sitting in between worlds, just as it is sitting with someone who's dying. It's the same door. <laughs> it's just at the other end. And so it's so humbling. It's so important. It's so empowering. It's so essential to invite souls to arrive with presence and awareness in a loving environment, in a body that is fully in her power, whatever that means, but that is a body that said yes. Yeah. That feels, I mean, I don't know, those of you that are listening, like this glimpse that we got, Amelia, of you being sort of defiant to that and a younger you, like your defiance to that. I don't know if defiance is the perfect word, but just this resistance to that merging or that embodiment. And then the way in which you have come full circle and now you are the, I mean, I can't even imagine um, you being there in the room, welcoming these souls into the world and helping these mothers, like mothering these mothers, like the way in which you've completely transmuted all of your personal experience in this lifetime into love and into service so that other souls can come in with like the most beautiful and sacred welcome. It's so beautiful and so generous of you to like give us a glimpse of that. It feels really, really, really so beautiful. Yeah. yeah, thank you for sharing that. And I would love to do maybe another episode around all that that is because I feel like there will be many listeners interested in the work that you do around that. And 
I'd love to give that some space, some more space, but this hour goes so quickly. And I don't want this hour to end before we touch on this real love that you have, this love affair that you have with plants and herbs (laughs) and how much of a part of the sacred is a part of your work. And this is especially one of the things that I love because when I was looking for some help going into my surgery, the way that Amelia shared with me that these plants or that these certain herbs or certain plants, I don't know if you use those words interchangeably, can be allies for you. Like, I just love that word. I love when you use that word and that you gave me the idea even just that I had these allies and plants that could help me in my healing. It was so beautiful just in my own experience. Will you just share a little bit around how you work with plants and what your love about, what is your love affair with this part of what you do and how does this come forward in the way in which you serve? Yeah, do you speaking about plants makes me joyful. So <laughs> that means a lot. <laughs> yeah. Right yeah. <laughs> yeah. Part of my whole journey was feeling disconnected to my body and, and in turn as well to the body of the earth. And I was always interested in herbs. As a little child, I refused to use any medication unless very, very, very necessary and was always very interested in alternative ways of healing. So always very interested in reading about herbs and understanding. And then many years later, I began to work on farms and to get more also just a body to body interaction with plants. And I began to remember, I began to realize that these plants were not just chemical compounds that could help for this and that, but that these were alive beings that had very unique personalities, that had very unique voices that could be, as you said, allies to my healing journey, whether it was something that had to do with my body or with my emotions or with my mind or with my spirit and soul. And that, just that was so healing. Just to begin to walk through the woods, to walk through the fields and realize, wow, I'm full of friends out here. (laughs) I'm full of beings that I want to know more about, that I want to connect more with. And as I open to them, I give to them. And as I do that, they give back to me. And so we return back into this cycle of reciprocity because all the plants feel so, so left out by us humans. Yeah. They're like, hey, have you forgotten about us? I mean, more than left out, probably very in grief of how we treat them and how we treat the soil and the earth and all of that. But it became very strong part of my work, both personally to learn how to become more porous, yeah, to learn how to listen to these whisperings. And I love to offer and I do repetitively uh, courses on this where a lot of the work is to relearn this capacity that we all have to communicate with the green world, with the natural world, so that we may become ourselves bridges of our healing. And this is so empowering because in our world, we are so focused on healing, needing the external doctor or healer or shaman. And this sort of flips the idea and says, hey, you can have direct relationship with these plants, which doesn't mean sometimes you won't need the specialist, but let's begin to heal this relationship. Let's begin to remember these ways that these plants can become friends and allies and how lavender has such a different personality than Uh, chamomile or calendula or whatever plant is in your backyard and then we become the medicine women again we become the witches again we become the priestesses the magdalens who worked with plants 
who worked with these allies so much and how did they learn about them? Not by reading a book, for sure, <laughs> but by sitting out there, drinking them, communicating with them, calling in their spirits. Yeah. yeah. So beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for all of this. It's so beautiful. At the end of every episode, I always ask the same three questions to each guest. And the first one is, which do you relate to the most today? Because <laughs> this is like, I'm sure it's ever changing. The word whole, healed, or holy, and why? Yeah, I was reflecting on this. And um, I think today, the word holy, as I have gone through this full circle of wanting to go back home and then having to really come to terms with my being here on earth and my fleshiness. Now the word holy brings me back in connection to divine, but from a very embodied place, from a place where I remember that I am a bridge between earth and sky and that this is my task here to fulfill myself as a bridge, as a portal as we could use many different words so definitely the word holy right now there is something that smells of the sacred that reminds me that brings me back into connection i am holy you are holy this body is holy everything is holy mm, and you're doing it so beautifully a book that you love or a book that you've gifted often yeah as someone who is deeply in reverence of poetry I always, always recommend this book by John O'Donohue, who is maybe my favorite poet of all times, or almost favorite poet of all times, Irish poet who passed away maybe 10 years ago. And um, he created this book called To Bless the Space Between Us. And it's a small book, and it's a series of poems to bless different moments of our lives and it blesses the most interesting moments that you'd never think it blesses of course the arrivals of a new baby of love of marriage but it blesses also the parents of those who have lost their child it blesses those who are experiencing separation or sickness it blesses, blesses and showers this life with blessing. And we need more blessing. We need more moments in which we stop and we say thank you, in which we stop and we remember the holy. And this book for me is like, oh, it becomes this bridge where I can, in moments of whether it's celebration or grief, I can stop and remember the holy. Yeah, I love that. I have not heard of it. And I'm definitely... <laughs> I'm definitely going to grab a copy. Thank you for that. A quote or a mantra that you love or that guides you. Uh, yeah. You shared earlier, <laughs> so yeah, I think it's probably not the top one, but it feels very relevant for today and I love it. And it's Mary Oliver who says sort of more or less, sorry if I'm mistaken, but hmm. You do not have to walk a thousand miles on your knees repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Mm. I love Mary Oliver. <laughs> Almost everything that she's written, I love. Yeah. yeah. Will you share the offerings or ways people can connect with you? Yeah. What are yeah. you offering and how can people find you if they want to learn more? Okay. Yeah. I have a website and an Instagram page and both go by the way of the soul. My Instagram has also a little underscore at the end. And yeah, I have many offerings actually coming up this summer. I have many retreats in Europe, uh, some led only by me, some co-led. I have a herbalism course. I have a retreat in Spain, in Orjiva, with a beautiful sister who is coming from the Sufi tradition. I teach a retreat in Greece about the fluid body and water and this primordial element of water. So if you check on my website, I have a lot of offerings there. 
I also offer one-on-ones uh, in different ways and containers, but they vary from soul mentorship to soul initiations and then work with plants. And then, of course, with birth. And this is my new latest offering. And of course, this has to be in person, although I've worked also online with many clients. I could not be part of their birth, but I was preparing them and making sure that that sacred space was opened up. I love that you're still doing so much in-person work. I think so many of us have gone almost completely virtual, but I love that you're still doing a lot of your work. It's still in circle and in community. And I just really love that. Yeah, I'm uh, very yeah. devoted to keeping that alive. Mm-hmm, I love that. And one of these days, I hope to be in circle with you. In the, in the yeah. Very yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for all that you are. And thank you for all that you share and for the service that you feel called to do. And thank you for being here with me and for sharing so generously your wisdom and your path and your heart. You are wise beyond your years and you are just a beautiful inspiration to all of us. Just a reminder of, of this holy place that we come from, of the sacred that is possible and of this embodiment, this porous embodiment practice that we can all be so deeply in thank you thank you thank you for listening it means a lot to me that we've shared this moment of deep conversation if you feel inspired or touched by something in this episode please leave a comment and or a review for more in all the ways please find me at whole healed holy on instagram and at www.patricia-russo.com on the web Stay close, please, and know that you are whole, you are healed, and you are holy. Until next time.